what are we doing as the church if the people in the church building aren't being protected if they feel scared uneasy in danger if they're being traumatized why are we even opening up the doors to the building hey everyone welcome back to my youtube channel my name is shelby bowen i am a christian life coach and today we are talking about eight signs your church or a church you might be going to or looking for has cultish red flags and tendencies before we jump into those eight red flags if you are healing from a spiritually abusive environment and you want support you want help i offer one-on-one -on -one coaching and we also have a free support group filled with people who are healing who are like-minded who come together to lament for one another and if you would like to join that support group i will link both that and my one-on-one -on -one resources down below okay as we get into this video, I have a list here on my phone. So if you see me looking down, this is from a reel that I posted, and we're just going to elaborate on some of these points on here. And before I get into it, I want to say that this video is not meant to for us to just go around and criticize every little thing that a pastor or, a, you know, wh whoever a church leader does, because that's not going to be helpful. But we do need to be aware of red flags so that we do not lift up and promote people who are operating out of spiritually abusive tendencies. And it's important that as we look at everything that's been going on in the church world today, that as the body of Christ, we start to take some self-responsibility as to why we continue to have itching ears, why we continue to follow and listen to people who are abusive, who do things that are unbiblical, that are harmful, that are show businessy and just out for personal gain. And this isn't just for us to sit on our high horses calling everybody out, but this is something for us to take responsibility and accountability on why we continue to promote these kinds of people. And I will say, I posted this video on a reel on Instagram, which we're diving deeper into on this format, and it's gotten almost a million and a half views and a lot of comments. A lot of people were really hyped up to talk about this subject. So the first point is an over-the-top charismatic leader, especially one who claims that they have special insight from God or insinuate that they have a special anointing and you must protect them and cover them no matter what they do. And so I want to distinguish that these are cult-ish signs because cult-ish is a lot harder to identify than cult. And that's not always true. Cult people can get lured into cults all day long and not realize until they're so deeply ingrained into that environment. So I don't want to say that it's just those things are so easy to spot. But I, I want to talk about the cult-ish because I think that these are things that are very prominent. They're very common in our church culture today. And so that is why I want to focus on that specifically. But when you think of a cult, they're going to be this times even worse. So an over-the-top charismatic leader, especially one who claims that they have special insight from God, you can tell by the way that someone carries themselves, the way that they walk onto a platform, the way that they interact with people, that they just think that they are so much better than everybody else. And that is not the attitude that we want from a pastor in a church. What are some of those characteristics that instead of just being overly charismatic that we should look for? I'm going to read some of those characteristics that we should look for. This is from united.edu and it says being respectable gentle self-controlled not quick-tempered or violent and modeling integrity according to titus 1 8 a pastor must be hospitable and love what is good first timothy 3 also says a pastor should be sober-minded not quarrelsome and able to manage their household well in addition to strong character certain spiritual gifts are essential for effective pastoral ministry these include the ability to preach teach lead and minister to others a pastor must be able to communicate biblical truths clearly and persuasively through preaching and the thing is 
So often in the church, we have just prioritized the latter of the two. The person who has the spiritual gifts is the one who's given the platform. But we've com like completely missed the behaviors and demonstrating the qualities that Christ did while he was here on this earth. And I want to say these are all behaviors that we should all try to emulate in our day-to-day -day lives, but especially so for a pastor, somebody who is leading God's sheep, God's people, God's vulnerable people. And we need to be people who know the word. We need to be people who do not have itching ears and are just swayed by the next charismatic leader, televangelist, or social media star that takes the stage. Because at that point, we just become so easily deceived. And I'll tell you, while I was healing from a lot of the spiritual abuse things that I went through, I had to take time away. I had to take a step back from the institution of the church and heal and read the Bible and truly relearn and get to know God for myself. And it wasn't even like before that I wasn't reading my Bible. I was, and yet still fell into these weird doctrines and harmful environments. And so how much more do we really need to protect our ears and our mind and our heart from these evil doctrines that can lurk inside the church walls? And the only way we can do that is being sober-minded, by knowing the Bible, knowing the word, understanding what it is to test people's prophecies to look at them by their fruit and not fruit is not how many social media followers they have fruit is not how many people are in the congregation to know them by their fruit is to know them by the decisions that they make in their life so the latter part of that first point was that it was somebody who claims they have special insight from god or a special anointing i think we all know and this has been talked about publicly so i don't have a problem saying this but Benny Hinn has many times insinuated that if you if you say something against God's anointed that you'll be cursed and then we can also hear um, from Mark Driscoll's conversation I think it was with John Lindell when that whole scenario happened at that mega church at the men's conference but essentially after they you know shook hands and became fine again the pastor who was with Mark Driscoll I think his name was John Lindell had said not to speak out against what, you know, the pastor or the speaker is saying. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, if someone is saying something that's inaccurate and unbiblical, we, of course, should be able to speak out about that. We're not going around and gossiping about um, things that we know whether to be true or not true. We are bringing up questions about the authenticity of the things that they say and there is nothing wrong with that and don't let ever 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 don't let anyone make you feel that it is because they will narcissists and spiritual abusers will make you feel like you are the problem that you are being judgmental that you have a problem i remember i was working for this ministry and um I, I raised a concern. These people that they wanted to partner with, I had been sitting with them alone, and these were people who have a huge ministry. And I asked them, because they all live in this big mansion together, I asked them, how do you find time to read the Bible and pray and spend time with God when you're surrounded by all of these people all the time? And they said that they don't, that that's not something that they prioritize doing. And that was a really big red flag to me. You're teaching people the Bible, yet you don't spend time reading it for yourself you're just learning it passed down from other people and then reteaching what you've been told that's not something that sounds very legit to me that's not something i think that we should partner with and i was made to feel like i was being very judgmental for saying that and so those are the things that you want to watch out for i knew i felt really bad i felt really guilty and shameful for saying what i did but the fact of the matter is it was appropriate to ask those kinds of questions to raise those kinds of red flags and that is how we protect the church that's how we protect god's vulnerable people and if someone says that they have some special anointing and some special insight from god that nobody else has i would be very alarmed there are people who claim that they know when Jesus is coming back, yet in the Bible it says nobody will know that. Oh, well, they claim they have special insight from God. Well, that's unbiblical, okay? We need to make sure that we know these things, you know? There's um, 
gosh, a fa- my family members were going to a church where a pastor claimed that God told her prophetic things he had never told anybody else before. And they were all things that were just very, very unbiblical and just created these cult-like environments. So I would definitely watch out for that. Okay, let's move on to point number two, which is they continuously tell you that you cannot trust your own thoughts and you must listen to their guidance over everything in your life. Okay, that is a huge red flag. Because that will start doing mind control. If you know uh, the bite model, and this is when it comes to cults. It's Stephen Hassan. He came up with the bite model. And it's behavior control, intellectual control, thought control, and emotional control. And that is so brainwashing to tell somebody that they can't trust themselves. Anything that they think or say. Because that is not what that Bible verse is telling us at all. It is telling us not to just be led by every shifting emotion and feeling that we have and every thought that we have, but we filter things through the word of God. We're not told to filter things through the pastor who claims that he's all knowing. That is not biblical. That is very harmful ideology. And you're going to adopt a lot of shame. You're going to adopt a lot of low self-control from that because it creates this hierarchy of, well, I'm just this this nasty, dirty person who I can't even trust my own thoughts, but I have this clean, perfect pastor who apparently is so much better than I am. And, you know, you just develop these feelings of of self-hatred. And it is not, that is not a place that you want to be in. It's not a place you want your family in. Okay, moving on to point number three. You notice yourself spending less time with friends and family. Now, I get it. You go to a church They have a lot of church functions. Okay, totally normal. But if you find them saying things to you like, well, God told me you need to cut them out of your life. You know, there's a lot of, I talk to people who are involved with prominent, prominent, prominent online deliverance ministries. And they were told that their family members have demons and they need to stay away from them. If somebody says that to you, run. And don't look back (laughs) because that is absolutely terrifying. That is very isolating and controlling. I mean, to say that, first off, Christians cannot have demons, okay? We can be, we, we, we don't war against flesh and blood. We are, we do, there is a spiritual battle. So don't get me wrong when I say that, but Christians cannot be possessed by demons. And so if someone is to tell you that your Christian family members have demons and you need to run from them, even if they are not Christians, I, I do not think the testimony of Jesus is to isolate everybody in our lives and only surround ourselves with these cult-like people who make us feel like we're dirty or we're bad if we hang around our family or friends who maybe don't go to the same church that we went to. Very, very controlling, very big red flag. Okay, point number four. You are repeatedly told that your giving should hurt your time and financial resources are exploited. And I know I just need to make individual videos about all of these things and we can dive deeper into some of them. But I was at um, a conference and some this woman got up on stage and she had said, God had told her that the more money people gave, the more out of debt they would be. Okay, this prosperity kind of teaching and that your giving should hurt and you just had the crowd whooping and hollering and they were cheering her on and the thing is as christians are we called to give absolutely but nowhere should the church be telling you and exploiting your finances and doing these things where if a a pastor is on salary at a church great okay but these whole you know special pastoral gifts and these pastoral wife gifts and like what no and and really we need to be looking at where is this money going you know if i'm if i'm giving a money to a church you better believe that i want to see where they spend their money and if you don't want to show me sayonara you ain't getting my money okay this whole well you just got to trust that god will use it however he wants and it's unto the lord that's just not enough for me and i don't think it should be enough for anybody you know you have pastors going out and spending thousands of dollars on rolls royces and buying these mansions and 
building these fancy buildings. I mean, it is absolutely insane. My husband is in commercial real estate and one of his friends um, is working on a project for a church. And the amount of money that churches spend on these ornate details from Tyler money is really sick to me. It just, it does not, does not bode over well. I think that the money in the church should not be used for fancy cars. And I, I'm not saying that pastors should be poor. I do not think that they should be poor. I think that they should, you know, have a decent salary. Um, but I think we need some financial accountability. And the love of money is the root of all evil. If a church is willing to do some nefarious things with their money, you better believe they're willing to do other things. Because once you open that door... A lot of other doors are opening too. And that is why I look at money in the church very closely, very carefully, because I think it, it shows a lot about their fear of the Lord, about their reverence of the church, about the reverence of their role, and uh, stewarding the resources of the congregation and the money that's coming in. Okay, point number five. If you don't attend all of their meetings, you are a weak believer. And they might not say that outright, you might just feel that from passive-aggressive comments like, oh, where were you last Wednesday night? And you're saying, oh, I had to watch my kids and couldn't go. Oh, well, you couldn't bring them. Susie was here and she had her kids here. And, you know, oh, you know, just the, the farther you keep your kids from the church, the less, you know, the more exposed they're going to be. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen. It's like a lot of this shaming and these subliminal messages, passive aggressive behavior, and they might not right tell you that you're a weak believer if you don't come to all of the services. And th these are not the standards. What is pure and undefiled religion, according to the Bible? To take care of widows in their time of need and to take care of orphans. What does God care about most? Not how many worship services you've attended this week or how many prayer meetings or how long you've been on your knees in your prayer room, okay? God cares that you are loving people, and that you are helping the defenseless, that you are going out there and taking care of the widow in her time of need or his time of need, that you are helping the orphan, the innocent, vulnerable child that has no home. This is what we're called to do, is to help one another in, in our time of need, to be there for each other. That is pure and undefiled religion. It isn't, you know, let me put on my perfect Christianista mask and come across as the perfect Christian woman because I'm going to all the services and look at me and how I'm serving. That really, that's just pride. You know, we don't need that. We need people who genuinely care to love one another and look after each other. Okay, number six, display spiritual elitism in a superiority complex. That ties back into point number one, and I want to go back to that website that I mentioned earlier, which is united.edu, and it says, at the heart of pastoral leadership is the ability to shepherd God's people, and this requires an exemplary moral character marked by spiritual maturity and wholeness. Several biblical passages emphasize the importance of integrity, gentleness, self-control, and purity of heart for those who are called to ministry. Pastors are expected to model Jesus' example of servant leadership acting as humble shepherds who lay down their lives for the sheep. I went to a really well-known church here in Orlando for a while, and I was part of their ministry school. And when I tell you the pastor walked uh, out with, with security guards, like he was the president of the United States, he was not accessible, his wife was not accessible, the VIP sat in the front of the house and all the uh, uh, everybody else was shuffled to the back like peasants and if you wanted to approach him or talk to him I mean you couldn't he was rushed in and out off stage on stage you know whatever and there was a point when we were in the ministry program and this pastor came in and he was like I see all of you worshiping so extravagantly trying to get my attention and it disgusts me and <laughs> that just uh it really breaks my heart when i think back at it 
um, cultivating that kind of environment. And maybe kids were doing that. Maybe people were doing that. But why is the first question. Why did they feel like they need to do that? What was the culture like that they felt like they needed to do that? And also, is this really the kind of behavior of somebody who's humble, someone who's willing to die, lay down their lives for God's people, for the sheep? It's just this mere moral superiority, this spiritual superiority, and it's not healthy. It's really prominent in the mega church world. It's really prominent in the Western church. And we, as people, as the church, have to take responsibility on why we continue to give these people a platform. Because we're giving them the ability to continue to act that way. It's on them for their behavior and what they do. But I think that we can also take accountability of saying, I'm not going to continue to support this and promote this. Okay, point number seven the lack of transparency. And we talked about that with finances, but this is really important for everything. Your church needs to be transparent to you about everything that is going on inside of the wall, all of the resources, all of their finances, um, any scandals that have happened. I mean, though, these are not things, if, if somebody has been hurt or abused in the church, it should not be covered up and swept under the rug. There was recently, and I can pull it up here there was a post from julie roy's the roy's report and it was I'll, I'll just read you this it says less than a week after gateway church founder robert morris faced accusations of child sex abuse the church settled a sexual harassment claim against a former gateway pastor rachel child childress filed a lawsuit in 2023 alleging sexual harassment in a hostile work environment while employed at gateway providing administrative support to pastor al pearson she accused pearson of sexual harassment and allegedly gateway pastors failed to listen and act on her accusations the case was settled for an undisclosed amount on june 21st according to court records I cannot imagine the tithers of that church are happy to know that their tithe money is going to settlements for reported sexual harassment claims. This woman claims that she went to church leaders, that she asked for help, that she explained her situation, and they didn't do anything. They didn't listen to her. They ignored her. Okay? This is not transparent. This is not kind. What are we doing? Honestly, oh my gosh, this will just make me so angry. What are we doing as the church if the people in the church building aren't being protected? If they feel scared, uneasy, in danger, if they're being traumatized, why are we even opening up the doors to the building? So we can have our celebrity pastor come on the stage and preach a feel-good message for an hour and then everyone can go home feeling good about themselves? Because that's essentially all that's happening. That'll get me. Transparency. If things are happening, the church members should know about it. If a complaint is brought up, there should be an investigation. We need to be good stewards. We need to love one another well. And the church does not need to be a place that traumatizes people. It should be a place for people to heal, to find community, to feel loved, to find support financially, emotionally, spiritually. Before I continue on that for the next hour, we'll go to our final point, which is point number eight. You have a fear of leaving. A lot of people who are in cults or cult-like environments feel like their salvation is at risk if they leave that church. And that's likely due to the programming that they've been through in that environment. And the way that our brains work, they look to affirm and confirm the narratives that we tell ourselves over and over again. And so if we tell ourselves over and over again, or we hear somebody tell us and we come into agreement with the fact that our salvation's at risk if we leave this church or this group, then we're going to look to affirm or confirm that in everything that we do. It's a really scary place to be in. You should never fear going to a new church. If you feel like you're 
supposed to move on and go somewhere else and be a part of a new thing. People should celebrate you. People should celebrate you as you come in, as you go. There should not be this whole talking trash about people behind their back when they leave. There should not be this whole disparaging people's character as they leave, making lies up about them. This is not at all how it should run. And if it is running that way, if you see that kind of behavior happening to other people, when people are in fear, when a pastor or leadership are in fear, then they will start tainting the name of every other person who has left. They'll start gossiping about them, spreading lies about their character, about why they left, and create these sob stories to make you feel bad for them. And if you see that happening a lot, take caution because usually it's coming from a place of fear because they're trying to hide or cover up things that they're doing wrong. And all of these eight points that we talked about today do not reflect the heart of God, which is why we need to be in the Bible, which is why we need to know God's heart so that we don't get led astray, so that we don't fall away from the faith because we go through a really tough experience in the church, a really traumatic experience in the church. And I can understand why people do, and it breaks my heart. And if you're in that place that you're healing and you feel like you just don't even know what's real anymore, you don't know what's right, you don't know what doctrine to believe, you have all these questions, I would encourage you to join our support group, find people who are in that same place. We, as the, the myself and a few other women who lead the support group, we've been there and we just desire to extend a helping hand to help you answer those questions for yourself. We are not going to tell you how to believe or what to think, but encourage you to find that knowledge for yourself so that you can become empowered in your own walk with God. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you're still here, if you're still listening, thank you for being here. It would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this YouTube channel and like this video. It helps get this content out there to more people who need to see it. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.